So we're coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, or one year, one message. Really, most commentators would say that the teachings of Jesus have ended with do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And really the point now, Jesus is saying, okay, so what are you going to do with this? You know, what are you going to do in living this out? So Jesus is inviting our response to the teaching that he's given here in the 13th verse of chapter 7. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits." When I was in India, I had the terrible experience of finding out that I arrived to the airport to get out of Vijwada an hour after my plane had already left. That's bad news in India, because after two weeks I was ready to get home, and I thought, I'm going to be stuck here for a long, long time. But the travel agent that worked with Air India did some good work and got me redirected to a flight to Hyderabad, Hyderabad, where I was then going to fly to Delhi. And because of the delay from snow at Newark, I was going to catch my flight from Delhi back to New York. All things worked together for good. But perhaps the reason why I was delayed and not on the first flight is that God wanted me to sit next to this guy. Can we cue it up, Trish? God is one, God is one, God is one for everyone. God God is one, God is one, God is one for everyone. God is here, God is there, God, God everywhere. God, God everywhere. God, God everywhere. God, God everywhere. God is one. God is one. I really, I like the policeman up there, because I'm not sure, I'm not sure why he ended up sitting there. Um, Obviously, when you're in India, you get honored with these lays, and I got many lays as I went around, but I think about midway through this song, he's probably thinking, what in the world has happened to me? Okay, that's good, Trish. Now, if you saw that guy, you probably wouldn't want to sit next to him on the plane, would you? But I saw that guy and I said, God, put me next to him. I want to sit next to that guy. And you know what happened to me? I sat down, three seats in the row, and not not only did he sit next to me, but I was in the window and he sat down in the middle. I was really excited about this. And I told him I was a pastor. I'm a religious leader, a guru in my own tribe. I would think he'd be excited about sharing some guru conversations together, but he kind of just cut me off. Kind of just cut me off. I wanted to talk to him about the Hindu concept of God because I was really struggling to understand that. I'd been to Varanasi. Varanasi is the, the highest, holiest place of Hinduism. It's on the Ganges River and the beautiful water that, that comes down from the Himalayas at one time was pure and clean, and you could bathe in the Ganges in clean water. But now the Ganges is is rancidly polluted, 
and uh, with the religious rites of Hinduism, they burn bodies in cremation. So the greatest thing that you can do is die in Varanasi and be cremated there because then you don't have to uh, be reincarnated. You can go straight to the energy, the force of Brahman. But the thing I didn't understand as I was in this city that just, just seemed so heavy and dark to me was what is the idea that you have of God? And so I sat down with uh, Vishwa, uh, Vishwa the guru, and I said, help me understand this. And he couldn't share with me anything of, of an idea about God. He just said, you know, all I know is we need to love each other. I like that. I'm all in favor of that. But I wanted to understand how are we empowered to do that in a world of so much hate, discord, and strife. I recognized we had radical differences in our understanding of religion and our understanding of God. I was on my way back to Hyderabad where a few days earlier I'd been with a bunch of church planters. These are all like young Davids going out to meet Goliath in that world of India, especially those that are headed north into the Muslim north. Because these young guys with so much fire in their heart and faith alive in their eyes are headed to some very tough times. Because there with radical Islam, they are not popular people and they could be headed to their death. I recognized in my time in India the differences between our faith and the challenges that are presented to us as we seek to live in this world together. Universalism may not be a hot-button topic to you, but it is in our world and it is in our culture. Divisions of religions have caused more wars and heartache than we can imagine. Perhaps than any other divisions in our world. But to say that the way we respond to it is like with our buddy on the video screen. If we can just start singing, God is one, God is one. God is one for everyone. God is Vishnu. God is Jesus. God is Allah. God is Muhammad. That's what he goes on and sings. saying, let's just get to the point where we all just get along and agree we're doing the same thing. That's a challenge. And it, it's a challenge that doesn't come from me. It's a challenge that comes from our culture because one of the things our culture says, right, is I'm so intolerant of intolerant people. Right? I can't stand anybody who's intolerant. But how do we deal with our differences? How do we live in the world together? I don't know if you were here when Doug, uh, Doug Leonard was here, but Doug is working in the El Aman Center in Oman, and he's become really a world-renowned expert on the relationships between Muslims and Christians. So I was surprised when Doug stood in our pulpit and preached from Ephesians 2, and he said, Christ is our peace. The way of Christ is the only way of peace. And as he shared that with a Muslim friend who was so hostile to Christianity and hostile to himself, Doug took him to a place, took him to a place that showed the way of Jesus. Do you know where that place was? The Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, to love your neighbors and hate your enemies. I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Doug says the way of Jesus is our only hope. And the challenge of Jesus that comes to us today is a challenge that speaks to this issue of how in the world do we live together? And Jesus is talking about an exclusivism that isn't simply an exclusivism between those that follow Allah, those that follow Hinduism, those that follow the way of Jesus. He's talking about within, within the way of those who follow Jesus. Isn't it amazing the words that we hear today? The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. 
But the way is easy and the gate is wide that leads to destruction. As we come this morning, we may ask with um, those that came up to Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and said, Lord, will only a few be saved? And Jesus says, strive to enter by the narrow gate. Jesus so oftentimes doesn't deal with the totality of the question. Like even the way Billy Graham did when Billy Graham was interviewed in one of the later interviews of his life and said, will Muslims and Jews and Hindus be saved? And I think Billy said something like, that's above my pay grade. Maybe that's not exactly what he said, but he said, that's in God's hands, not mine. Billy got in a lot of trouble for that. And a lot of people said, why didn't Billy say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. I think Billy was saying what Jesus would say, let me worry about them. You pay attention to what I have given you. So as we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus is wrapping it up and saying, what do we do with this? How do we live with this? I think I understand in a different way than when I've read this text before. Because just as last week we looked at that text on prayer, which so oftentimes we pull out and deal with just in a personal devotional study time and not in the totality of the place where it is, which Jesus is speaking at that point about judgment, discernment, and, and having a clear eye to see the truth. So today, so oftentimes we take this out of context and, and use it as a description of saying there's just going to be a few that will be saved. Or, or let's understand that, that I'm on the inside, you may be on the outside. Warren's going to be preaching next week, you know, and Warren's got the text, many who say, Lord, Lord, I'll say I never knew you. And usually when I hear that phrase, I say, I know who will be the right people to say, Lord, Lord. And I know the people that Jesus will say, oh, you got it wrong. But Jesus is inviting each one of us today to look at ourselves. So the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus has given us this teaching, we come to something that I think I, I understand in a new way as true. Because when Jesus lays out that text in John 14 and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus starts by saying what Doug Leonard was affirming, that the way of Jesus is the life. The life that's the fullness that he's speaking of here in the Sermon on the Mount. But who can live this life? If you've been on this journey for a year, I hope you've been humbled by the power of this sermon and the reality that we are so far from living the vision of the kingdom of God in this world as it's laid out for us by Jesus in, in this mountain. We talked about the, the gorillas of grace that come up to this mountain to hear the manifesto of a new world the manifesto of the kingdom of God lived on this earth in its fullness as God intended it. And Jesus gives us the way. And Jesus gives us this as truth. And that leads us into life because of who He is. The proof of the pudding in this preaching is the resurrection. I want you to understand that. That the Sermon on the Mount is not a three-step program to better happiness. The Sermon on the Mount comes from the very Son of God in human form saying this is the way to live fully alive and fully human with the presence of the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. But how many of us do that? How many of us even believe that? 
It's too hard. It's too lofty. It's, it's too far from where I am. And that's why I believe there's two things that Jesus said about this. He says, first of all, enter by the narrow gate. In John, Jesus says one of his famous I am statements. I am the gate. The opening to this life comes, first of all, through who He is. Through the grace that comes in Christ. It's not by what you do, it's by what's been done. It's how that gate is open to you. But when that gate is open, the road that you take is a straight road. is a narrow road. It's a hard road. Because to live this way takes supernatural strength that comes not from ourselves, but from God. It's not just Doug Leonard that sees this for the hope in Islam, but it's Gandhi that says it as well. As Gandhi says, Christ's Sermon on the Mount fills me with bliss even today. It's a sweet verse. It's a sweet verse here even today to quell and quench the agony of my soul. That's a Hindu man that sees in this message the truth of the way of life that Jesus is speaking of. G.K. Chesterton says, it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It's that Christianity has never been tried. And from a year of going through this message, I can say I'm only beginning to understand what, what the implications of that are. Because to start with, the Sermon on the Mount begins with the blessing that is in direct contrast to everything that our world says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. The meek. Those who persecuted for righteousness' sake. All those things that lay the foundation of what Jesus says is blessing is exactly opposite of what we want for our lives. Isn't it? It's exactly opposite of what the culture is teaching us. And Jesus says, this is how we're going to live into this world with these values of the kingdom. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones takes those Beatitudes at the beginning of the sermon and he says, when Jesus is talking about the fruit at the end of the sermon, he's inviting you to go back and visit the fruit at the start of the sermon. If you want to know what, um, what a wolf in sheep's clothing is looking like, if you look at the fruit, you say, look at the fruit of the Beatitude. If that's not reflected in that person, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And then he says the goal is not to pull out of the world, but to be the light of the world. The salt of the earth. See, see here's, here's the key. That we've been talking about this again and again. That the message is not, I want to make sure that I get my fire insurance policy. And Christianity is basically my fire insurance policy. That when I die at the end of my days on earth, and I enter the pearly gates, I'll be able to pull out the policy. Jesus is saying that eternal life starts now and is lived now and reflected in the way that we live together. So then from that call to be salt and light, you remember where Jesus goes. He says the scribes and the Pharisees, those that are sheep, wolves in sheep clothing, are the ones who, who try to set up the law as something that will crush you. But Jesus says, you've heard, you shall not murder. But I say, if you are angry with your brother or sister, you are in trouble. And what did Donald Trump say his favorite birth of the Bible was? An eye for an eye? I'm going to give Donald the benefit of the doubt and say he was quoting the Sermon on the Mount when he was saying, Give to anyone who asks of you. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those. If someone asks for your coat, give them your cloak as well. That's what he was quoting, right? His favorite verse is right there. But I understand it, Donald. It's tough to live in this world in that way. 
And that's why after this vision of what the kingdom looks like is laid out, Jesus gives us the tools of the kingdom, if you will, to say, you're not going to do this on your own. You're going to do it through prayer, through fasting, through giving, giving away that most sacred commodity of our culture, which is money, giving it away and saying, I trust my heavenly Father who clothes the grass of the field and feeds the birds of the air. Seek first His kingdom. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. And He'll take care. He'll take care of you. So the picture I want to give you today is not that Jesus is saying, who's out? Who's in? Let's start counting. He's saying, how about you? In what way will you live into the fullness of God's plan and God's kingdom for you? And he says, you have great potential to get waylaid in that because there's going to be a whole lot of people that will tell you you need to head in the other direction. Those that come as wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, usually when we think of this text, don't we think of those people we disagree with? If somebody's preaching an idea I don't agree with, or if somebody's talking in a way that I'm not comfortable with, they're really dressed up as sheep, but they're in wool's clothing, ready to devour. But Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll see a tree that is a good tree can't bear bad fruit. So I told you, Martin Lowe Jones feels like the fruit that Jesus is talking about is the fruit of the Beatitudes that starts this story. But he says you can really sum it up in humility. Not someone that reflects the work of the flesh as Paul says in Galatians. Lust and anger quarrelsomeness and envy, idolatry. He doesn't call those the fruit of the flesh. He calls those the work of the flesh. But then he said the fruit of the Spirit. The works is plural, but the fruit is singular. Is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, generosity, self-control. You will know them by their fruits, says Jesus. So I think of the people that have shaped my life. The people that I say, I want a piece of what they have. Think about those people in your life right now. Right now. Don't you think of people that reflect that fruit? That fruit of the Spirit? You shall know them by their fruit. And we are called to reflect that good fruit in our lives, and I love the fact that Jesus connects this with the tree. Because you know, this is a story about the trees. The tree of life. That's what we're seeking to get to, right? That, that that's given to us, that vision in Genesis, but the sin separate us, of, us from that tree of life. But there in the garden was the tree of life. Do you know when that tree appears again? In the end. In Revelation. For there it shall be in the center of the city, the tree of life. It's a reminder that we're living between these two trees. And the truth of the servant on the mount and the truth of what Jesus is preaching that He practices in the way He lives is in the center of this story there's another tree. And that tree shapes the vision of living in this world in a way that is narrow. In a way that is straight. In a way that is difficult. Because that tree is a cross. And Jesus didn't just say these words on the mountaintop with His disciples that day. He lived these words. He forgave His enemies. He absorbed Evil on the cross. He did not repay evil for evil, but He repaid evil 
for good. So finally, the vision of how we live, the Sermon on the Mount here, is what Jesus gives us when He says to us, take up your cross and follow Me. Between those two trees is that tree for the healing of our world that you're called to reflect the fruit of that tree. The good news of the Gospel is this. The way certainly is straight. It's hard. And many will say, I just cannot live that way. But the gate that's open to us is the gate of Jesus Christ. The gate of life that calls us to travel that road. To recognize that we will fall. That we will fail. But there in the way of loving our enemies. Of being the salt in life. Of recognizing the poor in spirit are the ones who receive the kingdom of heaven. We see life lived in its fullness, in its fullness, and not the way of destruction. Pray with me this morning. Lord, today as we talk about that topic of of universalism, really it's a question that comes right down to us in our walk with You. That Jesus, by His life, death, resurrection, and ascension, has given us given us our calling in this world and our hope for the world to come. So today, Lord, as we hear this message, we pray that we don't take this message and say it's for somebody else, but we take this message and say this day it is for us. That all that has been spoken about the way of life spoken to us by Jesus The one who is risen from the dead, the one who has come from God, returned from God, is the one that gives us the words of life. And I pray, Lord, recognizing it is difficult, but that each person in this room today takes up the cross and follows Him, not for the glory of self, but for the glory of You. In Jesus' name, Amen.